Hello, welcome to Digital Tabletop Fest 2, the RPD edition, and I am absolutely delighted to be joined by someone I would argue is one of the most important RPG creators working today, working in a digital medium, and you'll find out why I feel that as this discussion goes forward. Um, the creator of Disco Elysium, and uh, Robert, if you'd be able to introduce yourself, that would be fantastic. Um, um, yeah, so uh, I'm Robert Gurwitz, and uh, and I'm uh, a writer and designer on Disco Elysium, and uh, and I performed all sorts of uh, 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 high octane and uh, high stress uh, duties on that game. Uh, Perfect. And well, what I would start with is backing up my claims in that lofty introduction of, as why I think what you're doing is so important. Uh, and we'll get into a bit of your history in in, in tabletop in, in shortly, and and uh, you know, as part of that contact, share a bit of mine. But the reason that I, I, I want to congratulate you on Disco Elysium, the reason I think it's so important, and get your reaction to my take on it, is. Um, when I first saw the game came out and I saw lots of people raving about it and I looked at the screenshots of it and I was like, oh yeah, it looks really nice, but it just looks like an RPG where you're having dialogue. Like I've played loads of RPGs where you're having dialogue. I think it's one of those titles where it was only when I actually played it that I realized quite how innovative what you were doing were in terms of using exposition, in terms of um, the, the thought processes of the characters, the, the, the sheer breadth of the types of character interactions, the skill set linked to the interactions. I mean, you know, you've obviously had tons of accolades on the game. Do you, do you feel what you're doing is kind of driving the medium forward? Uh, yeah, I would hope. <clears throat> I would hope it is. Um, I've seen little, uh, little hopeful signs uh, in um, RPGs released after Discoverism. Um, I've, um, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try not to name drop them because, uh, you know, uh, I, I sound megalomaniacal, but, uh, <laughs> uh, I've, I've seen, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps it's not, uh, <clears throat> perhaps it's a nice humble brag to say that I don't think it's so much, uh, uh, uh the influence of Disco Elysium than just Disco Elysium itself is part of a direction that, uh, that, uh, uh, CRPGs are going in, uh, but uh, I've seen um, uh, much more skill checks uh, in dialogues and then much more detailed um, skill representations of, of, of d and systems. Uh, and I've also seen uh, little glimpses of, of, of uh, fort cabinet-like systems. Uh, so inventories for forts, which I've thought, you know, I've waited for a long time for something like that to, to come along. Uh, to just add the uh, loot to talking, basically, uh, which 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 is that what the fort cabinet system in Disco Elysium is? It's a it's a kind of inventory for forts that we came up with to uh, uh, to to make your uh, reward centers uh, light up uh, during conversations too. You know, uh, if you in a, in a tactical RPG, you take down an enemy, you get their loot. So you know, uh, what what is the, what is the reward system of 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 a conversation, and uh, I've seen, you know, very, uh, a very cool uh, RPG that I like. Uh, uh, okay, Death Trash is its name. Uh, also, yes. have a, yeah, a no, that, I saw it as well. Yeah, and I was, I was really, I was really happy to to see it there. So these little things like this kind of make me happy. But then there are larger kind of uh, forces which I don't think were that um, influential on. Um, but uh, but I do see little elements of it in there. Uh, Baldur's Gate 3 uh, uh, has on-screen dice rolls. So uh, for a long time in, uh, in, in CRPGs, there was, um, was a dislike towards what uh, I've now discovered people call RNG, random number generators, yes. which is, I think, uh, a derogatory term for dice rolls. Yes. <laughs> and um, I'm rather surprised to find out that, that, that people whose life is you know, main hobby is dice rolls. Uh, now call them RNGs in in CRPGs. Um, I, I believe that's probably uh, it was it was inexplicable why why there weren't enough why there weren't dice rolls in in CRPGs uh, skill dice rolls and represented dice rolls as Baldur's Skate Three and and Disco Elysium too. Uh, I have a suspicion that it might be because of Josh Sawyer, a designer from Obsidian whom I admire greatly, but uh, uh, who absolutely hates 
RNGs, as he calls them, and he's been very influential on the CRPG uh, genre. Uh, <laughs> what is your, do you know Josh and I, is I, paranoia theory correct? <laughs> no, I, I don't, but I, I think you raise a really interesting point with role playing games in that, you know, we, we did a, a port of an old chain, uh, games workshop board game called Chains and Warrior, and the first version of it, we you had the dice rolls in it as because it was a port of the physical game, but we didn't actually show the dice. You just got the results, the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of my colleagues at the time was like, "Why don't we show the dice when you're going to get rolled across the screen onto it?" And and I think that just really lifts it. I, th I think somehow then the player sees the actual dice rolling. They get the sense that those numbers are fair inadvertently confidence. You know, seeing the dice. Uh, I remember on a previous role playing game I'd worked on called Call of Duty: The Wasted Land had a long email conversation with a player who was convinced those random numbers were not random because that player had had a series of you know actions where in combat where they 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 thought they were going to win and they didn't and they were like angrily emailing me and I, I did actually sit down with the random number generator at the game system and generate a hundred numbers and write them all down to just show look they really are random and <laughs> you roll them enough time and I thought God, why am I doing this and it, but but it, it's that thing I think that sense of dice give the randomness of life into the game and i think the player i think players like that and they like to know what those numbers are there's also just the incredible uh, satisfying tactile sound of, of dice throwing and then disco Elysium doesn't use it, it uses a, a a kind of metaphor for for dice rolling the the, the tape starts rolling in the background but uh, mm -hmm. we kind of uh, fine-tuned the sound of it to sound a bit like dice uh, rolling. Uh, the, the sound of dice rolling is something incredibly... Uh, there's something deeply satisfying and, and even calming and, and mm. uh, oh, definitely. cozy about it. Uh, because that, you know, we, we've been throwing dice and uh, knuckle bones and, and all kinds of things for tens of thousands of, of years, probably. <laughs> and, uh, and, and and there's something incredibly satisfying uh, about kind of that moment when, uh, uh, when, when, the, when the dice are in the air, when they haven't landed yet, there's a kind of suspension, a mm. little excitement moment. So if, if you, you guys did the same thing, then you probably noticed that when you prototype the menu to kind of show that moment and clicked mm. on it, it's immediately incredibly and yeah. enjoyable to kind of see that moment. Uh, Definitely. So, so that is actually a good point to kind of jump back into your past a little. So I, I think one of the things that would be, for me at least, really interesting is to know a little of your history in, in role-playing games. Like, you know, I, I've read obviously that Disco Elysium had these huge influences in tabletop RPGs. Um, I mean, you know, for me, that, you know, that journey began way back when Dungeons and Dragons back in the you know the eighties um playing what would have been second edition Dungeons and Dragons and like the first time I played it I was like you know really blown away by the idea that there was this thing that was a game but it was a story it was both of them and it was like those games you played as a kid where you just swear say well pretend I'm this pretend I'm that but it had this common language of rules that allowed it to be you to play in the same world and that just blew me away and from then on, you know, I was hooked on on role playing games, and I've been a fan ever since. What what about for you? How did you arrive at, at that interest? I, I think there's something. I think there's um, I think this is very meaningful and and important psychological moment that uh, that children uh, all uh, experience uh, when they play uh, pretend games or the. It's very strange. What what are the rules of the games that children play with Legos, for example? Uh, you come up with a world, and then you know you build these uh, these ice planet guys, and the knights are there, and so on. And then and then you play for a while, and then children are able to to invest meaning uh, into this uh, uh, chaotic, ungoverned by rules uh, system for a while. But then, even as a child, I noticed that suddenly, kind of meaning evaporates from uh, you know the knights and, and the ice planet lego guys and suddenly everyone's looking at them like what is what is, what is this <laughs> the grown-up kind of uh, uh uh logic thinking comes in and asks but the, what are the rules of this like are we just why is this guy flying and why why isn't that guy flying and so on and then suddenly uh meaning kind of uh, leaves the game and then the 
to me in 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 what I and I had a similar experience. I hadn't played uh, uh, pen and paper RPGs before. I hadn't played Dungeons and Dragons, but I heard about it when I was about eleven from my dad, who was a very cool dad. So he <laughs> uh, in in the you know post Soviet Estonia to have heard in the nineties about Dungeons and Dragons was like. I had a cool dad, and then uh, and he explained to me like uh, what's kind of going on there, like the, the concept of it, and I, I felt even when I was like eleven, I felt that this uh, this solves that problem that I've been having with games, where they kind of evaporate, the meaning goes away from them. This uh, this it, it it seemed like magnetically revolutionary to me this idea that you can take uh, away the tactile legos and and uh, and objects part of it uh, uh and then leave only conversation and, and ideas but then add very concrete to me almost like incredibly advanced feeling rules like, like just the idea that there's a rule system that governs i asked my dad but but what I, well, there's no board you know all the questions that people usually have about pen and paper role playing games and he kind of explained to me the point of it and I, I thought it was incredi an incredibly advanced idea to 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 put all of storytelling, kind of this completely virtual, boardless space, and then that rules uh, to it. And it felt like it 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 solves the kind of central problems of games uh, for me. The games I've been ha you know I've had I've been playing with, with my niece and my friends when I was when I was young, and uh, it took me I think four or five years until I finally got to play. Uh, Kind of got got my hands on one of these sets. Uh, but that wasn't cool enough to <laughs> <laughs> procure me uh, these uh, Western goods. Uh, so and when I finally did, I I I didn't get Dungeons and Dragons. I got a Finnish uh, uh, kind of uh, role playing system that was intended for you to uh, play uh, uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, Middle Earth games uh, directly. It was. It's probably not very known. I don't remember its name even. It was a very rudimentary system, but it did. Uh, it did, uh, and we were of course all Lord of the Rings fans, as you are, and then it did. Uh, it did kind of introduce the general point of it to us, the kind mm. of dungeon master, the rules, uh, the, the concept of how it goes, and all these questions of like these disbelief of kind of, but that's going to be lame. How's that going to work, and so on. It, it dispelled all this this doubt for us. And uh, about after like one game of this this system, we or like two games of this system, we were so excited. And then the other we, I mean me, and a lot of people who ended up writing Disco Elysium, that we immediately uh, abandoned the entire system, also abandoned playing it sadly, uh, and then started making our own uh, role playing system. And and we became, I think we were about 15, 16, and we became incredibly stupidly ambitious with it but right? like we we had decided that uh, that we are going to be some kind of uh, uh some kind of uh, tabletop role playing uh, messiah group. <laughs> <laughs> that, that our setting and system they need to be of course uh, united you know they need to be the same thing that it's going to be uh, uh, we were also planning to write it in estonian by the way but somehow miraculously <laughs> it's going to be you know world changing uh and uh, and that I guess we love this uh, this like, like it's an ambition, but it's um, it's not like it's not a, it's not a mean ambition like ambitions usually are. Like I want to be the biggest rock star on earth. That sounds like ah oh, you know I want to you know I want to do the, all the macho masculine weird things that rock stars do and so on. But but this felt like a, like a small enough thing so that it was enjoyable to uh, imagine it into this megalomaniacal dream. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and then innocent enough to become megalomaniacal about. Uh, and yes, yeah, so after that we spent about ten years, I think, uh, just working on the setting, working on the rules. Revolution after revolution, we kicked out old ideas. Uh, uh, we we got rid of medievalism, and then we we started in a in a kind of maybe Bronze Age kind of setting, and uh, kept moving through historical periods and different systems. And then came up with, uh, and finally also started playing it after like I think five, six years. <laughs> not getting like literally, we were so excited that we couldn't we stop playing, <laughs> couldn't play the thing we were so excited about. Uh, and then uh, and then kind of worked on our storytelling powers, and uh, and then we think around 2000 and um, 
six so about six seven years after we started or five years uh, we kind of landed on we had we had moved to a modernism uh, in that setting we had moved from all the previous historical periods and then the and then we'd cast aside the kind of uh, very tactical uh, combat uh, kind of number uh, crunching very crunchy side of, of tabletop systems which I adore by the way but uh, uh, that wasn't uh, it, it wasn't uh, important to our kind of uh, core ambitions of, of world building and 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 kind of high concept rule systems and we we, we arrived at uh, at a very story centric or, or a very storytelling centric uh, tool uh, with what we thought was simply said and I still to this day think that it's a, it's quite a simple uh, system uh, so uh, we were, of course, immensely proud of, of what we had uh, achieved, and then uh, we'd also achieved it, uh, you know, uh, with no help, almost uh, in a, you know, or the opposite of help, uh, uh, every possible kind of material resistance. You know, I dropped out of school, and, and things things were going very well <laughs> like, uh, in in the early aughts in 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 this ultra neoliberal uh, Estonian state like pe people didn't think that, that that this is a this is a clever career move uh, but uh, but yeah we were immensely proud when we started finally playing it and started discovering this um, unique atmosphere that uh, that the Rizim games uh, have and, and that we have hopefully been now able to bottle into a kind of CRPG experience so that sounds like there's almost a straight line from 15 year old you excitedly building an rpg system to disco elysium yeah i'm uh, i'm a uh, i'm a how do i do how do how do i what's what's a good expression for it um i'm a project human being <laughs> <laughs> I, how do you mean <laughs> i uh, i'm a project for myself uh, oh i see very long-term project yes <laughs> with with uh, with stupid things and and uh you know, on the way, I've had to like write scripts for for movies and and and, and uh, do all the uh, the the culture hustle because video games are incredibly difficult to get into because uh, of their budgetary constraints and so on. Uh, but but yeah, there is a very straight line. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's something I've worked on all my my life, and it's been very gratifying to to arrive at the, at the, at the conclusion and to get to share my my and our all, all our works with. Uh, uh with people because so many of these projects don't materialize especially these very yeah yeah ambitious ones i mean how how did that come about because you, you're right like the, the cost of making a game is pretty big and the bigger the ambition of what you're trying to do and obviously you're doing a whole bunch of innovative things within it and a whole bunch of stuff that just takes time and money to do how did you end up going from that scrappy rpg that a bunch of teenagers are making to a fully formed development operation um it was it had a lot to do with um uh, well the idea or the the core feeling of of what we had um the feeling of being in the setting uh, was so magnetic to us and then we were so confident that uh, that it's 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 worthwhile. That it just, uh, despite being uh, very unlikely and, uh, and 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 incredibly difficult to uh, to kind of iron into some kind of product or or or, uh, or a workable life plan, uh, it it just kept beating out the other ideas. It, it just kept being uh, so somehow more magnetic and, and mysterious and, and, and interesting we whatever else we did we kind of kept returning to it always uh, as if you know returning to ourselves or, or, or our, mm. our, our ancient dreams and uh, and uh, you know as as, as we grow, grow older and older we uh, and then the crude failures in other fields uh, you know we uh, we had uh, uh, as unlikely as it was, uh, scrape together some kind of uh, heft of social heft and the minimal you know to uh, 
to do something or, or people for some reason some people <laughs> with money had started to believe that uh, uh, that 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 we are really really dead set on, on doing this uh, and uh, you know the miracles of capitalism came and <laughs> and and, uh, and that diverted some of those hard won resources uh, into what we did. So, I mean, that's a good good area to then dig into the the. So, what do you see the principal legacy of tabletop role playing games in Disco Elysium? Like, you know, playing it. There's a whole bunch of stuff that jumps out at me, but but you know, like. To me, for me, for example, the the thought cabinet and the the amount of exposition that that you get through the dialogue section on the game is very reminiscent of playing a role playing game when the party are discussing what to do when you're DMing it and they're like you know you come to this situation what are you going to do and then they all have a big chat amongst themselves like that that felt to me analogous of a party of players discussing what's going on what they think you should do all that i mean you know what do what do you feel what do you look at when you look at the game that you've worked on and say these are clearly tabletop role playing ele elements that we pulled in all of it it's um, it we started the, the games we started um, the the tabletop sessions we started having finally when the setting and system started coming together uh they were uh we felt um, um so dear and interesting to us that that, that we we, just, we we simply wanted to do something with that experience. You know that, that's the big problem with tabletop games. It's like how do you bottle it? You know how do you how do you present it? Uh, and then uh, and then we, we we wanted to you know we we couldn't DM it uh, for the whole world. We couldn't DM it for for hundred people. So uh, uh, when we started making a CRPG, that it was just. It was just straight, straight up that easy for us. It was okay. Like let's use programming to uh, uh, to to bring that experience to uh, like an industrial amount of people, uh, and then the, the basically industrialize uh, the the DM experience. And then, I mean, I think we even like uh, audaciously said that that uh, in some in some of our marketing at the time that that, that we intended to be you know the truest representation of, of, of the tabletop experience in in in, in video game format uh, which I now look at like for example I'm playing uh, Wrath of uh, the Righteous the new uh, Pathfinder game and that's also that. that that is also some of the realest some of the most detailed representation of an adventure module that I've ever seen in CRPGs and our game is very different from from the Pathfinder game so mm -hmm. I, I realized that uh, and by the way I love that uh, Pathfinder game, like huge kudos to to, to the guys who made it. Uh, but uh, I, I did find out that that our understanding of what tabletop is was very different from, you know, <laughs> the understanding of other people. So for us, this Elysium is exactly it's it's it is the truest that you can be. It's slavishly true to to the the feeling and the systems of of an Elysium. A tabletop uh, experience, just mm -hmm. like uh, like uh, Wrath of the Righteous is uh, uh, slavishly true to to a Pathfinder module and and then systems uh, design. So yeah, everything, uh, especially the 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 no, one of the things is is the uh, the composition of dialogue to combat. That there is very mm -hmm. little combat, but there is this kind of uh, central action scene, uh, as if you would have in uh, there's a film called Heat, which I like this. Uh, Michael Mann. Oh yes, big, big, big fan. Yeah, big fan of uh, Michael Mann's work, and yeah, big fan of Heat. So yeah. it's an amazing film. And I think that film uh, is the best example of an action scene. It's, there's one in the middle of it. It's huge. It's it's really really interesting. And there's a little one in the end, but and otherwise it's a completely actionless uh, film. Uh, yeah. But uh, that also like the influence of Heat, I think, became our 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 design etalon for kind of. Uh, uh, pacing and structuring action scenes in a story that there should be really, really uh, consequential and 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 uh, tactile and, and terrifying action. Well, action is even a violence, basically, is perhaps a better word for it. Uh, but but it should come uh, like this assault somewhere, not all the time, you know. Because if you want to tell a story, then um, just a guy killing everyone isn't a very interesting story for a very long time. <laughs> uh, but but in our storytelling rhythms, it it it, it that, that for example, like uh, Disco Elysium's uh, 
uh, kind of ratio of, of talk to, to action uh, is, is, is a clear example of what we what we started moving towards in in uh, in uh, in our tabletop games. By the way, also uh, uh, Nick Pizzolatto has the same structure. His uh, True Detective series has a uh, one huge action scene in the middle of it always. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean the, the I mean the, yeah. I'm a big fan of True Detective, and yeah. I mean they they do the same in series two as well, don't they? With the big gunfight when they go to arrest yeah. the drug dealers, and it's just huge and explosive and everything like that yeah and if, if, if the point is to make you feel that that could always happen because in reality it can in, in certain lines of duty but to you know uh, to do that economically and then and, and try yeah. like so yeah i mean it, my it, idea for kind of pen and paper games yeah i mean when i discovered true detective i absolutely loved it and for me the, the there's a couple of things he does in there i guess running the interview get a digression for us to talk about true detective for a minute but well, it has all those Carcosa references, so you know references back to things like Call of Duty, yeah, yeah. etc. It's, it's it's essentially a it's essentially a, a a Lovecraftian story, but it's very very intelligently done, and it's sort of he pushes the the kind of Arkham horror story as far away from the Scooby Doo vibe and as deeply into the uh, serious vibe as possible. But there is still a tiny element of Scooby Doo in there, which I love. <laughs> yeah, no, he definitely has that. But I, I mean, for me also, I love the way they use the unreliable narrator, mm -hmm. which obviously, you know, is a is a very powerful RPG tool mm -hmm. to, to, you know, where you can't trust what you're being told. And they do that brilliantly in True Detective. You know, I think of the scene where they talk about where they go to arrest the guy and the action reports for the scene obviously said a big gunfight broke out. And uh, spoilers for anyone who's seen True Detective, turn off now. Um, but where the big gun break broke, broke out, and then you see what really happened, which was not what mm. their action reports are, and that leads you in, lulls you into this sense that maybe these people aren't that accustomed to violence in the way, and then it has scenes of intense violence in it later on. It's, it's, yeah, it, I think that that combination, the unreliable narrator, as you say, and the very choreographed, like action sequences within it, are combined with this straightforward detective work. You know it's very powerful and, and and again you know i think that to me in disco elysium to sort of circle it back around i really love the way the detective side of it is used where little little clues you pick up innocuously are all there to add to the picture and obviously then you allow the player to get a handle on some of those through sometimes quite overtly telling the player this is an important clue other times a little less so I mean, how much did that procedural side of the detective story, you know, where, where did that come from as part of the design? So, uh, you know, as, as much as I as much as I envi admire what uh, what I what I weirdly call linear storytelling, uh, you now I I I and then then through detective is a great example of like a modern American uh, uh, writer uh, really really pushing new things and, and new new tricks into it. I think the, the opportunities in storytelling that uh, that uh, pen and paper role playing and that CRPGs and that what I would call is programmed literature, for example. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, pen and paper is is, is a kind of uh, communal, uh, kind of written on water literature, uh, almost tribal. Uh, not almost; it's entirely tribal. Uh, and and then CRPGs are a kind of incredibly modern idea with their kind of programmed one of way to go about it. For, but for me, they are a novel, two novel uh, uh, connected and, and, and mutually complementing approaches to literature and storytelling that both completely blow, you know, linear storytelling uh, out of the water, like the possibilities uh, in in just the, the, the mind tricks and, and, and the kind of unbelievably deep atmosphere that, uh, that 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 you can you can you can do in 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 tabletop role playing games and that we've tried to get some part of into a crpg form uh are just uh, are just uh, the, the, they're kind of unparalleled i think in storytelling mm. uh like there's something incredibly interesting that happens to memories <clears throat> uh when you when you play uh, when you play tabletop uh, uh role playing games uh, like compared to the memories I have of films, for example, uh, the the spaces I've visited in in, in tabletop role playing games, they're 
almost as if I was there. They are truly filled with like all the stuff of nostalgia. Like uh, I could almost smell what 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 the rain smelled like and so on in, in that imagined room. And then everyone has this kind of ge psychogeographic kind of image of of those streets and and, and those rooms and, and the faces of the people, which is you know almost uh, it, 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 it has a level of verisimilitude where it's almost in, inseparable from actual memories. Uh, it is it's so real and also not as intense, but almost 90% of it, I think, video game spaces uh, do for me. I think it's something that memory and space are incredibly mm. uh, combined in the human brain. That's probably the first uh, uh, first uh, uh, task of, 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 of consciousness is to um, is to navigate space and then any storytelling thing that that gives you a real space to move in starts forming these incredibly powerful memories uh much more than than than, than just a two-dimensional uh, uh screen that i was looking at mm. and i have to uh, navigate uh, it does so uh, like the memories i have of, of playing uh, the first fallout game or 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 a place game torment with, with that music uh, Mark Morgan's new soundtrack starting to play are are these other work, worldly kind of life forming memories for me, and then I, I quickly began to understand that, damn, you can't take, you can't catch that lightning of a, of a tabletop game into a into a bottle, but what became uh, what became a, a, a hurdle of imagination that I was unable to uh, to pass for like I think ten or twelve years was simply it was almost as I had. Uh, I had forbidden myself the dream of an Elysium uh, uh, video game, uh, simply because dreams need to have an element of, of credibility and possibility to be really, you know, interesting <laughs> to us. They can't be outlandish, and that had an outlandish element in it, which is that the uh, the budget of of it would have to be millions, and I had. Like four euros was a problem for me. Like, <laughs> pack of cigarettes was like you know something I worked on for two days. <laughs> so so it, it was it, it was I I now look back and I think why didn't I always imagine like video games? Why didn't I imagine putting that into video games? But it was it was simply around the corner for me. I was I was unable to access that. I was unable to dream in that way. And when we finally met up with with producers and uh, and then business people and who gave gave us the structure and this incredibly sustainable opportunity for which I'm just uh, eternally grateful uh, that I started thinking all these years I could have you know also gone in that uh, gone in that direction so I really I don't know like maybe in the future uh, game engines and uh, and then the real estate market and all kinds of horrific structures in reality become more benevolent towards people dreaming about doing things in video games and up until that point uh, Tabletop is is tangible, doable. You can do it with three, four friends. Uh, mm. So, I mean, for me, that I think that you pick up on really interesting stuff, which is I feel that when you read a book or watch a film, like very enjoyable experiences, and you can feel like you're there. But there are secondhand experiences that you you you're just experiencing somebody else's world, somebody else's vision. Whereas I think when you play a game, be it tabletop role playing game, video game you know, um, even games as a kid, because you are part of the creation of that story, because you are driving that story and that story is built around you, they become almost like first-hand experiences. And I find it interesting when you talk, you hear people talk about the experience of playing a game, the experience of, um, it's all that first person talk they do. And then we did this, and then this happened to us. Mm -hmm. Whereas you're reading a book, it's like, yes, that was very powerful. That happened to the character that happened to you know, so I, I feel it, 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 it draws those, but you, um, in terms of then the, you know, you, you've talked uh, a number of other interviews and that, the kind of challenges of making the game, you alluded to that, just you said that you go from this thing that you were dreaming about to, you know, then having the resources to make it. Was there a point in that development where you started realizing that you've got something here, that the bottling of the, the magic of RPGs, you'd actually got there? Uh, the uh, so we had a vertical slice at first. Uh, we talked to Asel and then the the proto ravers on the ice. Uh, so uh, I already felt there. I, I felt when I was writing them that I got some, like I got something from myself here. 
uh, when I started uh, using uh, uh, branching dialogue editors, uh, for me as a writer, it really clicked. Like, I, I could I could suddenly, I think Asel was the first dialogue I made, and I I, I could like, there's a, there's a joke there uh, where you fail an authority check and uh, and then the, and then you suddenly your your kind of masculine authority is laughably wounded and then and, and you become very very angry about her telling you hey man fuck the hat and then i remember writing that scene and it just really really became ludicrous and then started doing weird things as a writer i was like i i discovered i i, I found out that there's something for me here that that i didn't have in any any other any other form of writing and by that the time i'd written a novel and, and, and screenplay and then I, I, poems and, and all kinds of writing uh, but where we where we saw that this does something to other people also uh, and even even there i think uh, the talking skills already people were commenting that you know getting uh, getting excited about them but uh but what what was a real proof of concept for us was the beginning of the game like we had a summer where it was a kind of make or break moment for our studio where uh, we were running out of money as you always are as a, as a startup and uh, and then you really need to uh, you really need to, uh, uh, to present something, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, to prove that uh, that this is uh, worth further investment. And then, the, and yeah, we we delivered the beginning of the game um, from waking up to getting out, uh, stepping out of the whirling in rags. And then we already had uh, had C powers music in there, and then the, it, it looked very much as it does does now. And then, the, and it was very sticky. Like people started playing it. It made a lot of sense to them immediately. It was funny. It was understandable. Uh, I think uh, we were very happy with how we'd overcome uh, the storytelling hurdles of of, of lore dumps and and, and 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 kind of very aggressively putting you you in the shoes of Harry or this uh, you don't know even with this cop <laughs> who you wake up as. Uh, so. Uh, so yeah, that, that beginning for us was it was a lodestar that kept us going uh, for all of, all of production basically. Whenever we showed it, yeah. it, just, it just made sense to them. No, I mean I love the way you use you know that the central character can't remember anything. It's, it's so not like you say you don't have to have this huge lore dump at the start mm -hmm. that explains the world and the setting. And it's like I just want to be playing. I, I thought that was I thought that was really clever. But the, the, the real trick is there is that it, he doesn't not remember uh, that he's uh, uh, the spawn of, of sorrow, uh, uh, you know, the prince of Neveria, which is kind of like, you know, <laughs> sure, that it's a problem if you don't remember that you are that, but I don't understand what the stakes there are. He doesn't remember that he's a cop. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, becomes, it comes as a huge surprise to him. But, but what I, I think I, I originally thought uh, of this, th this introduction was an idea that that I had for a for a tabletop game, and we were already making a, a much larger version of Disco Elysium uh, by that time, which we had to cut down to uh, to something manageable. And then one of my ideas, why we were not making, I meant pre-producing, basically, as we were pre-producing, is that I should have like a little D and D session with with our executive executive producer and a friend, of, another friend of mine who wasn't even on the project, just to. You know, get the juices flowing. You know, just to uh, experience something other than, than video game making for a moment. And for that, I I, I think it's about the twentieth D and D campaign opening idea that I've that I've had to come up with with during my my game master times. But uh, for that uh, time, I, I I I think I came up with the one that I was most proud of up until that moment for effectiveness. And the idea was. It's my, my friend Kaur, uh, executive producer on, on Disco Elysium, and then the, and you know he's had a he's a, he's a, he's had a uh, how do you say it? a storied life you know uh, he's ten years older than me and uh, and then he's, he's seen life and uh, and I, I I thought that it would be incredibly funny to introduce him and he he's not a disco guy he's a, he's a, he's a hip hop person you know he, but to introduce him piece by piece to the character that I that I want him to play in this uh, this uh, game and to use the clothes that are lying around the apartment when you wake up like can't mm -hmm. remember anything super hungover and the clothes are like awful disco clothes <laughs> 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 that immediately makes you think like what, what who is this what, what what am I 
why do why do I have like bell bottom pants and so on? Uh, so so I thought that would be a very nice like tactile kind of way to pull on these like old clothes in the tabletop setting. Okay. And then you know, oh, then you have a face, you know, you go see yourself in the in the mirror. I think I really got like uh, got the D and D opening boiled down to. to oh, that's no, great. I, I I love the the bit where you 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 detect what happened to the window, you know, the broken window and mm -hmm. the glass that must, something must've been thrown about the size of a fist as this was it. And it's like, yeah, it's your shoe. And it's just a really nice, like I'm a detective, but I don't really know it yet, but I have figured out where my shoe is, mm -hmm. but I'm also so not together that I don't have two shoes. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> I really like that. It's also a, it's also a classic uh, Elysium story beginning, which no one has ever seen another Elysium story beginning. So, uh, but, uh, but I can share it uh, for us. Uh, all Elysium games uh, start with where you're waking up. Uh, it's a uh, morning uh, ritual completely, I think, uh, puts you into the shoes of, of a character uh, in, in a modern setting. Uh, everything about you, every morning you discover yourself, you know. Uh, and then there's a kind of loneliness and, uh, and, and everyday wonder and, and the mystery to kind of waking up and finding yourself in this conscious state again. And, uh, and it, it, it was also like the 20th wake up. Uh, that I've done in Elysium and the rudest of the awakenings uh, thus far. So, I mean, just how terrifying are the dialogue trees in Disco Elysium then, you know, it, it, from a player point of view, they look, well, as a game designer playing the game, I'm scared to think about how ter how big they are. I mean, how, how, how scary are they? They're very, very scary. Uh, they do some things that I wouldn't ever do again, that I'm not wiser to, to do. And they do some things that are um, they're just stupid, like, uh, and that no one has, no one has noticed, and no one has said, "Wow, thank you for putting like three months of work <laughs> <laughs> under under that," uh, and then and play testing and then bug finding and then so on. Uh, but yeah, they're they're incredibly frightening. There's a there's a good example. I don't know if I've shared this, but but there's a weird example in that game. I can I can now divulge perhaps. Yes, please do. There's something I would never do again, which is called. Uh, 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 old soul. Uh, so uh, th there's a in the in the very beginning of the game, or it, it, it has to do with the second day actually. Uh, there's a perpetrator uh, uh, in the yard where a man has been hung, and then some of the uh, and then you, you can you can look at their uh, your their footprints in the mud, and then you can discover that one of them has an old soul. Uh, like that, the, there's a, there's a, some, some some kind of weird pattern on, on on their footprint, and oh my god, did we do stu stupid things with it? You you can then go to the Hardy Boys and then then say, hey, you know, I found an odd soul pattern there, and then that would be okay. This is already very problematic because you can you can talk to the Hardy Boys before getting that, you know, finding right. that, you, know, you can you can you can talk to, to find the find the footprint first, and you can talk to the Hardy Boys. Okay. But you know, even that I would already like if I would, if I would, uh, if I would look at that, and it, it always it needs to be a good scene too. You know, to all all of these, this kind of uh, programming garbage needs to translate into you know like good fiction, understandable things where the player kind of they will always have the challenge that if you're a detective in a detective game who doesn't understand the logic of the story, it completely breaks apart because you are the the governor of the logic of the story. You need to understand the tech. You can watch a detective story and not understand what the detective is doing, but if you play it and you are the tech detective and you don't understand the information, then it melts away. So that was pretty complicated already. But then there's a side quest where you can get to the to the cabin in in a lorry of that same person who has that uh, odd soul pattern. So this is three points, and you can do them in any order. The three right. times two is nine. And the, this is this is in programming. It's called a, a programmer. A friend of mine says it's called the matrix calculation, where you need some of them are 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 redundant, and you need to find out first which of them are redundant, which of them kind of copy each other, so you don't do triple the work and so on. <laughs> he ended up with finally we needed to have a dedicated writer on it on the old soul, <laughs> uh, and it was also called the old soul fuckery, uh, and that we needed to have someone on the fuckery. Uh, and then it took them, uh, whoever went there, it took them five days to internalize the system. They needed to write the document, and the document was, was uh, I think, uh, one of our writers cast a cure 
uh, who joined us, uh, I think, in the final year uh, of, 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 of finishing up Disco Elysium. Uh, he heroically took it upon himself. He's a very, very clever guy. He's really good with systems. And heroically took it upon himself. <laughs> and, and, and it took him five days, and I saw the document he had produced <laughs> to kind of do that matrix calculation. Uh, and uh, and later on, whenever there's a bug, whenever there's a weird thing happening with the old soul mystery, it, you've always forgotten the system, and someone needs to take five days to become the old soul like, <laughs> just to start moving like one of those Jenga pieces around. So I would never do this free point propagation information system ever, ever again. But they are they are so frightening that if I would hear right now that uh, someone would tell me that it's a bug report in the old soul. <laughs> I would just say, uh, I'm sorry, it's going to have to stay there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I suppose you could just say, oh, unreliable narrators, the game's full of them. Mm. So if it doesn't make any sense, that that's yeah. the world. That's not, that's not, that's mm. intentional. I meant that. Harry's brain is too mangled up to yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, here's, here's the point. Like, did you, you've played this collision right now, mm. right? Did you like get any enjoyment out of this old soul fuckery? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. The thing is, I, I didn't see it as a separate system. I guess as a player, mm -hmm. that there's just a story that's unfolding. You know, yeah. um, I didn't even notice it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. That, that, <laughs> I feel really bad now that somebody <laughs> spent so long doing the thing. I mean, the whole game's amazing, and I've really enjoyed the game. Could I pull out the bit with the soul and say that was, yeah, that that was, was my favorite awesome. moment? Yeah. <laughs> when I found that when I found the footprint, I was like, yeah, that, that's it. Mm. Like, this is great. Yeah. I, I gave it, I gave it a, you know, I gave it a thumbs up on Steam just on the footprint. I'll go and write a review now. Amazing <laughs> footprint story <laughs> on the old soul. <laughs> yeah. Very ambitious programming structure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, picking on that and the writing thing, what would be interesting your take. So, so we we're based in Bristol in the UK, and Bristol has a very big film scene. So you know, there's, there's a number of film production companies and, you know, uh, that sort of TV production companies. And I, I end up sometimes at events where there's a lot of film and TV people here. And I love film and TV, watch lots of it, get it. But one of the comments that I often get that really annoys me is they'll say, oh, you're, you're a games person. Well, why don't you hook up with these film and TV people? Because they know story. Yeah. They come and help you do story. And I, and I think, no, games are really good I at doing story. You. I can help you do a story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. The structuring uh, linear narratives is, is it's not easy. Like it has its own uh, its own um, limit. It's its own difficulties because it is is limited in, in that way. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I do, it's not easy. Like writing a novel is not easy. Like writing a novel is. Perhaps even in some ways harder than, than than writing a video game. Although writing a video game is so much more stressful and, and terrifying because of the systems and the money and the budgets, yes. you know. Yes. Uh, but uh, but the loneliness of writing a novel, it's yeah, it's you get you turn into that Stephen King character very very easily. Uh, but uh, I, I I have that said, I have immense uh, uh, respect for modern writers' rooms. Like what they do is. Uh, you, have you seen Succession? Yes. Yeah. Amazing drama. Yeah. Unbelievable. They, they are able to like, like, put out the, the perfect script at the end of every week. I guess doing that uh, that, that game, and then the, there's something very similar in in that scenes and and in video game writing, in that it's a team effort. Mm. Like the future of storytelling is not one person tells a story. Like we've we've gone as far, I think. Of course, there will be stories told by one single person that will be, you know, very captivating and so on. But uh, but in some ways, sort of technologically speaking, we've gone as far as we can with what is achievable by one person. And then and now, just like in programming, the time of the time for like the hero genius programmer who does it all themselves and is a, not a people's person and and then so on. It's uh, they're still you know respected and needed, but but that's kind of drawing to an end. And now it's now it's uh, the people who can program together you know, mm. can achieve huge things. And the same thing for for writing. I think uh, the the future of, of 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 storytelling is in putting many writers together and seeing what they can achieve together. Uh, and then uh, and then TV writers rooms are at the forefront of that. Uh, but I would also argue that games, uh, uh, with their 
very, very demanding kind of. If they're not writers' rooms, they're they're writer boilers, I guess. Uh, yeah, it, it's. I think for me, it's that the the writing for a game because of that extra facet of the player's interactivity in the story. You don't know where the player is necessarily going to be. You don't know what necessarily everything they will have experienced, what they will have taken in. Whereas when you're writing in linear form, you can focus the camera, the point of the audience's attention at a certain mm -hmm. point and make sure they're looking at what you want them to see so that they pick that up. Whereas in a game, you don't necessarily know that they've joined all those dots together. They've been in the right place, like you say, with the, you know, the Orchu problem that, you know, what will they have experienced up to this point? Mm -hmm. And to me, that means it's just a very different skill set. So, you know, a film and TV person something saying, well, we'll come and do your writing for you. It's like, well, no, that's like asking a, a car mechanic to, you know, come and fix an aeroplane. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're mechanics. Mm -hmm. They both do the same thing, but they do completely different systems. And you can't you can't just swap them. Mm. I, there's a, there's this um, I've, I've been feeling I've been feeling a little uh, uh, a little uh, mystically lately, <laughs> a little mysterious lately, uh, thinking about uh, about role playing systems and uh, and 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 writing. Uh, I I do think that there's a there's a shared uh, mystery and, and desire in writers across any any platform that that you're doing to discover um, an unworld, uh, a world not made of objects and mm. the kind of unforgiving robustness of of reality but but the world that's made of uh, of ideas and and, uh, and 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 promises and mysteries uh but i think if i could if i could you know if i could try to sell uh to to very talented writers room people uh the idea of, of writing a uh, a video game uh it's that uh it's got it's got to do with with the memory thing that we talked about uh, mm. before yeah. it's that as a writer when you're when you're writing something to me uh, the most mysterious question slowly became mm, so okay i'm i'm describing mm, a set of actions in in let's say a room an apartment in our apartment uh, building and then the good stuff is happening here what is happening in the in next door in the apartment next door like what happens in in that uh, imaginary virtual space in uh, where where the eye of of the narrator and the characters isn't currently being put is there nothing there is it, mm. is it sort of like is it sort of like you know uh, the gray box of a video game where you can go on across the uh, yeah. and i don't think that's the case i think there's and then this is the really really mysterious thing there's the next room filled with new people, new objects. It's it just come. It's just the kind of like a video game that develops itself out of nothingness constantly. So as as a single story writer, you constantly feel that there are these other kind of grottos uh, and these nuggets of 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 or these uh, sections of the honeycomb that you could have gone into, and then a story just as significant as this one. What's happening there, and you know, yeah. what 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 is, what? How do you get? To, and I think that's the kind of source of, of the mystery of writing, and in games, and especially in tabletop games, you can get incredibly close to that idea. You can really go to that other apartment. Well, this is a perfect point because we have reached the end point to to finish the the, the interview, the discussion um, on the mystery of, like you say, what what's going to come next. So. I just want to say a huge thank you to you for, for spending your time and really giving us a kind of glimpse into uh, what's going on in your head and what's going on in, in, in you know, in, in Disco Elysium's head. Um, so thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it.